All right, guys, welcome back. This is Bad Senator. So today we are going to look at potential sleeper races in the Senate and the governorships that really are not viewed as competitive right now, but I think could become competitive under the right circumstances. So let's start in the Senate here. In the Senate, this is what the competitive map basically. I'd argue that Wisconsin should be solid blue. Um, yeah, we'll leave it as solid blue because that's what I think. So you start with 24... Excuse me, 42 Democrats to 48 Republicans. So this is where you'd go from here. There would be 10 competitive races. However, there are a few races out here that are currently rated as solid for a party that I think could become competitive given the right circumstances. Let's start on the Republican side. Texas. I've stated my reason before why I think Texas is likely to go to Ted Cruz. And why I think Ted Cruz is definitely the favorite to win. However, Beto O'Rourke is certainly um, a strong candidate. He needs a lot of money. He's a representative to the House. He's, well, like, kind of definitely a lot more charismatic than Ted Cruz. I mean, I think that's anyone on either side. That isn't really um, a disputable fact. And I think, you know, if the blue wave is really, really strong this year, and I don't think it's going to be, but if it is, then you could see Texas coming into play. Hmm. Then you have Mississippi on um, the current Senate race there. The three-way race between Mike Espy, Cindy Hyde-Smith, and Chris McDaniel. So Cindy Hyde-Smith is more of a center-right kind of Republican. Mike Espy, kind of a center-left Democrat. And Chris McDaniel, which is the Steve Bannon-endorsed, I believe, borderline alt-right candidate. And so obviously what, what happens in Mississippi is they have the election, right? Now, if a candidate gets more than 50% of the vote, then they win automatically. However, if no candidate gets 50%, then the top two vote getters advance to the runoff election. So obviously, Mike Espy here, he's probably going to be in that runoff because he's the only major Democrat candidate. The Republican vote is split between two candidates, Hyde Smith and um, McDaniel. Now, Mississippi is a pretty conservative state, but it's not conservative enough for the... Republican vote to be split between two candidates and for one candidate to be likely to get over 50%. I mean, look, what Roy Moore, yeah, I guess um, Chris McDaniel could kind of pull like a Roy Moore upset in the primary. Roy Moore obviously beat Luther Strange in the primary in Alabama. And then he um, eventually blew the race against Doug Jones. He could have won. I mean, I think that he, if he had debated Doug Jones, he could have won, um, even with the um, whole accusations, but that's an, another video. Anyway, but this is a bit different, because, like, this, um, in the Mississippi general election is going to include not just Republicans, but also independents, too. And the independents are more likely to support Hyde Smith than uh, McDaniel. And I think because of that, you're not going to see a Roy Moore upset in Alabama in the primary. So obviously, I think the runoff is going to be Hyde Smith versus Espy. And under that scenario, I think Hyde Smith would have a near 100% chance of winning. However, if I'm wrong and McDaniel is the one that advances the primary with Espy, then you can start to see the streets becoming a bit more competitive. It may even be toss-up or lean Republican, because McDaniel has some pretty extreme views. He has said some stuff from the past that probably would not be good for him. And he's like this ultra arch conservative candidate against a more moderate, moderate's a bit of a stretch, center left would be a better way to describe Mike Espy. And in Mississippi, this is a majority, not a majority black state, but a pretty darn close. I think it's 33%. One third of the state's population is black. And I think that Mike Espy could win in a race with McDaniel. And that's how that race could become competitive. Let's look at some sleeper races up here in the North. There are two main sleeper races I see becoming competitive for the Democrats, being in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. So Pennsylvania, Bob Casey versus Lou Barletta. Um, Bob Casey, it is really it's kind of hard to gauge how popular he really is, because like there are some sources saying that he is, and some sources say that he isn't popular. I mean, he's a pretty good fit for his state, given with how he votes in the Senate. But I've heard that there is kind of a disdain for him in some areas of the state. 
And if Lupar later runs a strong campaign, he could definitely make the race a race. Over in New Jersey, um, we have the menendez hugan race. Menendez, you may have um, known by this point, was indicted on a corruption trial, on a corruption case. Now, he was, he was able to get the scandal cleared from his name. However, that's obviously not very good baggage to have. And, of course, if anything comes of that scandal during the campaign, like an October surprise or something like that, then Bob Hugan could definitely be competitive. Um, I actually live, I don't live in New Jersey, but I live close enough to the border where I see the campaign ads. And Bob Hugan is getting a head start on Bob Menendez. So this race could definitely be competitive if something comes out of the Menendez scandal. And then in um, 2019, you would have 46 guaranteed Republicans to 40 guaranteed Democrats. All right, let's take a look at the governors. In the governor's race, so let's go back to the um, 2018 battleground. Okay, so again, I can't argue that Iowa is not competitive. That's off the table, and I'd argue that Pennsylvania um, and New Hampshire and Maryland are also off the table at this point. And New Mexico was also off the table. I actually think that's going to go with the Democrats. That's, I think that's a safe Democrat flip right now. Steve Pierce kind of, well, like this district, but that's only one third of the state. And I think that the more Democrat parts of the state are going to come out for Luge and Grisham in the end. So I think that state's off the table right now for the Re Republicans. And this is the map you have right now. 11 competitive seats. Now, here are some races I think could really be competitive. Let's start in Georgia. Georgia, here, um, obviously, you probably heard about it. C.C. Abrams winning the primary there. And, like, she had a, her main strategy is to try to get an energized African-American voter turnout, with, which contrasted a lot to Cece Evans' approach. Cece Evans was her primary challenger. Cece Evans was like, okay, we need to get moderate rural voters who don't really like Trump, I guess, more moderate suburban Republicans to vote for me, and that's how I'm going to win. Cece Abrams had a more left approach in trying to get them... A higher black turnout by appealing to their issues more and that's obviously going to be a more progressive and if that works that could definitely work this is georgia we're talking about here so this could definitely work especially if brian kemp ends up being the republican nominee let's go north tennessee tennessee could really be a sleeper race if the blue wave is really strong here then tennessee could be competitive and that's because i believe um I forget who the name is, but the governor of Tennessee, not the governor of Tennessee, the um, mayor of Nashville is running. Mayor of Nashville's have gone to become Tennessee governors before, and he is certainly a strong contender. Um, let's go to Oklahoma here. Oklahoma, yes, you heard that right, Oklahoma. I believe that Oklahoma could be competitive in November. Here's why I think that. Okay, so right now you have the governor, Mary Fallon. Mary Fallon is not a popular governor. She has made national headlines for underpaying her state's teachers, which led to many strikes in her state. That's not going to help the Republican nominee at all. The teacher strikes, the activism we see on the Democrat side in Oklahoma is not helping the Republicans at all. And on the Democrat side, you have a good candidate in the former attorney general of the state of Oklahoma who served under the very popular governor, Brad Henry. Brad Henry was a Democrat you think he wouldn't win Oklahoma, but he actually won with over two-thirds of the vote in 2006. So I think perhaps a new coalition here of teachers, students, and about half of the usually Republican voters that voted for Brad Henry in 06. If that coalition really comes together, you can definitely see that how the Democrat wins this race. And same thing in to the north in Kansas. Um, Kansas, you don't really have the teachers' strikes. What you do have is a very unpopular Republican governor. And you do have a good Democrat candidate, a state senator who serves a district that voted for Trump heavily. If that state senator wins, then he could make inroads with him as a more moderate, centrist, appeal kind of candidate. However, I think this one is less likely to become competitive than Oklahoma, because instead of having the current unpopular governor in place, he was appointed, Sam Brownback, who is who I'm referring to, 
he was appointed by the Trump administration to a cabinet position, I think, um, at large um, ambassador for, for religious freedom. And because of that, you now have Jeff Collier, who will probably be running. If Jeff Collier wins GOP primary, this is an intense GOP primary against Chris Kobach, the state um, secretary of state. Chris Kobach has made national headlines for some rather extremist views. If Kobach wins the primary, then this race will probably be competitive. If Collier wins the primary, this race is a lot less likely to be competitive. You see, Collier, um, he'll gain a lot of popularity for cleaning up Brownback's mess, you might be able to say. He might be able to clean up Brownback's mess a bit and get popularity. Um, Arizona, why is that Why is that red? That should be um, teal, or tan, excuse me. Rhode Island, that should also be tan. I explained why in an early video, I think this one's actually toss-up, even though all the pundits have it as least lean or likely, I think it's toss-up. I explained that in an earlier video. Two potential um, sleeper races on the Democrat side, New York and Oregon. Now, those are going to come as big surprises, and I'll explain why I think those pieces could end up being competitive in a bit. In New York... Um, you have the Cynthia Nixon primary challenge. The current governor here in New York is Andrew Cuomo. Andy, good old Andy Cuomo um, is facing a primary challenge from his left by the very progressive, very liberal actor, Cynthia Nixon. Now, um, Cynthia Nixon is running a strong campaign, and she's not going to give up on this race just because Cuomo was nominated by the, Dem the state Democrat Party. A lot of bad stuff has come out about Cuomo during this primary. A lot of bad stuff. And then, with the whole thing with A.G. Schneiderman, Attorney General Schneiderman, and the whole, you know, corruption, Me Too thing, that is not helping Cuomo either. The third thing is that you have the Republican candidate, Mark Molinaro. Now, Mark Molinaro, I actually um know a lot more about this race than your average Joe in another state. Like Larry Sabato, he lives in Virginia, I think, and Nathan Gonzalez, who lives in California. I'm from New York, so I know a lot more about this race. Mark Molinaro was more of a moderate Republican, kind of like a George Pataki Republican. And maybe he can have that appeal, like he'd swing over some George Pataki voters and swing over some voters of the candidate that lost the primary. So, I mean, Cynthia Nixon, like, Mark Molinaro is actually regressive on, like, in some issues. So, some of the Cynthia Nixon voters may end up voting for... Molinaro if he wins the primary, or if Cuomo wins the primary, because he's progressive on a few issues. And then Cuomo, if Cuomo loses the primary, then Cynthia Nixon is, has a very questionable history at a, as a show called Sex and the City. And that might turn away some of the older, more traditional Democrats who could end up voting for Molinaro. And that's why I think that race could be end up being competitive. Finally, Oregon. In Oregon, Kate Brown, current governor, is facing off against Newt Bueller. As of right now, Newt Bueller, um, a poll came out showing Newt Bueller is actually beating Kate Brown, which is a big surprise. And the reason why I don't think it's competitive right now is because that was an internal poll done by the Newt Bueller campaign. However, it is still a poll. And it still does show that if Bueller can run a good campaign, then he may make the race competitive. And that's it. That's all I have for this video. Those are all the races, I believe, that could become competitive in November. So, as we can see, each party has 20, Republic 20 Republican seats that they can bet on in November, along with 11 Democrat seats. And the governors by party, this is what they can be sure of. This is what each party can be sure of in 2019. Thanks for watching. Bye.